Out of the past, phantoms of a world gone by speak again their immortal tale, The Man Without a Country. Philip Nolan, officer in the pay of the United States Army. I have so many memories of Philip Nolan. I think I was the only friend he ever had. I think I was the only man who really knew him during his whole incredible lifetime. I knew what he suffered when his boy's dream turned into a living nightmare. And it all started so innocently. Philip Nolan was 20 years old or so, and he'd conceived a bad case of hero worship for Aaron Burr. Burr. Philip and I were stationed together at camp. We were in the Legion of the West. And it was then, in the year 1805, that we had become close friends. I remember one particular evening that Philip and I were strolling down the barracks together. Philip was excited. Hey, you'll imagine. Burr will be here. Here at this camp tonight. And I've permission to see him. That's a man for you, Hale, a real man. You know what they say about him? He's going to break away from the United States. And he's got an army behind him, an empire before him. Conquer Mexico. You know what? I'd enlist behind Aaron Burr and follow him straight to hell if it were necessary. I wonder if I could enlist with him. I'll ask him tonight. That's what I'll do. Tonight. That was a great day for poor Nolan. As soon as Burr arrived, he sent for Nolan. Nolan responded immediately, and he ran from barracks all the way to the great man's room. He knocked on the door, and in a frenzy of impatience, waited. He didn't know it then, but he was waiting for a living death. A living death. Mr. Nolan. Well, sir, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Mr. Burr, I've... I've written you repeatedly, time and time again. I thought when you didn't answer, you'd, you'd forgotten me. Forgotten you? Indeed, no. Come in, boy. No, I haven't forgotten you. Nolan, I need you. I have some great plans for you. For me, Mr. Burr? Plans for me? Yes, indeed. Sir, sir, is it true what they say? Well, Nolan, that depends on... What they say. You can tell me that. You, uh... You're starting a new army? You're out for empire to set yourself up over Mexico and... Ah! So they've gathered that much, have they? Well, Nolan, don't spread that rumor around. But between you and me... You and me? Oh, Mr. Burr, I... Sir... Nolan, you're a good man. How would you like to take me out in your skiff and show me the cane brick or a cottonwood tree? I've always been interested in the terrain in these parts. Interested? Or uh, is this terrain part of your plan too, Mr. Burr? Well, we'll talk about that in your skiff. Time enough out there, Nolan. Yes, there was time enough to talk about a lot of things in the skiff. By the time that sail was over, poor Nolan was enlisted in Aaron Burr's scheme body and soul. What that scheme was, I never knew, nor does anybody else. But that's not important now. It fell through, and every man of that group was arrested. Nolan was tried for treason. The big fellows, the ringleaders, escaped, but not Nolan. Nolan was taken before a military court. Old Colonel Morgan was presiding. Hours had passed, and the evidence against Nolan was piling up. His own commanding officer was saying... Nolan, do you deny that you are a traitor to the United States? Mr. Nolan, can you deny that you agreed to march anywhere at any time under the command of the traitorous Aaron Burr, even if he had commanded you to march against your own country, to march against the United States? No, I don't deny it. Mr. Nolan... As presiding judge, I want to ask one question before the gentlemen of this court will judge you. Have you anything to say in defense of yourself? Can you prove that you have always been faithful to the United States of America? Damn the United States! 
But I wish I may never hear of the United States again. Yes, Nolan said, damn the United States. He had no way of realizing the consequences. I'm not trying to justify Nolan. I'm just saying that the United States wasn't a reality to him. The only thing he cared about was Burr, Aaron Burr. So he said, damn the United States. Old Colonel Morgan called the court into his private chamber and returned in 15 minutes with a face white as a sheet. He just stood and stared at Nolan. And then, with his voice quaking... Philip Nolan, hear the sentence. The court has decided, subject to the approval of the president, Mr. Jefferson, that you never hear the name of the United States again. Ha! <laughs> Mr. Marshall... Take the prisoner to New Orleans in an armed boat and deliver him to Captain Shaw of the Nautilus. See that no one mentions the name of the United States to the prisoner. Make my respects to Captain Shaw and request him to carry out my orders. He will receive written orders from Washington to explain this in detail. The court is adjourned. I don't care, Colonel Morgan. I tell you, I don't care. I'd say the same thing over and over again. Damn the United States! Damn the United States! Nolan was taken to New Orleans and placed on board the Nautilus. The ship set out for sea and traveled from New Orleans to the North American coast. It was at dock there that Captain Shaw received intelligence of the proceedings by mail. On board ship that evening, they were docked in the harbor. Captain Shaw explained it to Nolan. Nolan was still the swaggering youngster then, as the old captain related. Well, Mr. Nolan, the word has come through from your former country's capital. From Washington? Yes, Mr. Nolan. Well, what is the happy word? You're a man without a country, Mr. Nolan. Without a country? The court has sentenced you to have your wish fulfilled. You will never hear of your country again. You will live on board ship for the rest of your life. You may wear whatever uniform you wish. Surely, my own uniform. The buttons will have to be changed for plain buttons. Well, why is that, sir? There is the insignia of the... of your ex-country on the buttons. What? I see. You will remain under guard, of course, to prevent your escape. Naturally. But otherwise, you will have the freedom of the ship. And believe me, Mr. Nolan, you will not be exposed to any kind of indignity. Thank you, Captain. Thank you very much. And so it was that the man without a country sailed the seven seas. He never stayed on one boat for more than a year. He went from ship to ship. And it was ten years later that he was again shipping out on the Nautilus. He was shipping out of England this time. And I had been sent over from America to England for special research. I was to come back on board the Nautilus myself. And so, of course, the very first day at sea... I was called into the captain's cabin. Oh, hello, Lieutenant Hale. Won't you come in? Thank you, Captain Shaw. Uh, sit down, sir. Thank you. I, uh, I called you into my cabin to talk to you about Philip Nolan. You no doubt know he's on board with us this trip. Yes, I've been told. He's an old friend of yours, I believe. Well, yes, we were in the Western Legion together. You know the story. Are they still maintaining silence, Captain? I'm afraid so. And as long as you're on board my boat, I must ask you to please never mention the United States to Nolan. No news of home, no talk about old times, no word of his family, and especially no word of the United States. Well, of course, sir. Whatever you say. And, uh, Mr. Hale, be prepared for a shock when you see Nolan. He's changed. He's changed a lot more than you realize. Changed. Yes, the captain warned me. But I wasn't prepared for what I saw. Nolan was an old man. An old man at 32. He was standing with a guard at the railing of the Nautilus when I approached him. He wheeled around and stared at me for a moment. Hail! Hail, old boy! It's, it's good to see you. I, I didn't know. I had no idea. Philip, 
Hello. It's been a long time. Oh, it's all right, guard. You can leave me alone with Hale. I won't escape. That's sir. Uh, I'll take full responsibility for him. Of course, sir. I'll report to the captain. Hale. Look at me. I'm still your old friend, am I not? Of course, Philip. Where have you been? What have you done since I last saw you? I, uh... I traveled around. Been in England. England? What happened after you left the Western Legion? Well, I, uh... I... You... You what? But tell me, Hale. I... I've read a lot of good books. Books? <laughs> That's just great. You too, Hale. I can't help it, Philip. Have you any idea what I'm going through? From boat to boat, always being shifted. Always under guard. Every book I read is carefully edited. Whole passages are torn out of it. I never eat dinner at one table. I'm shifted around all the time. Nobody can stand my company night after night. I have so little to talk about. And I'm... I'm so hungry for home. So hungry for news of home. My family, my country. I want to touch the ground, the land. I want to know what happened to Texas. What did they do to Aaron Burr? Hale, ten years of this. Ten years. I was just a boy. I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know. Please, Philip, please. I'm sorry, Hale. Seeing you again. And you're the only person who knows I feel this way. I won't mention it again. I know you won't, Philip. Don't tell anybody. You... You won't tell anybody. Well, of course I won't. Four o'clock. I have a little duty to perform at four. Well, what's that, Philip? <laughs> I read to them, the sailors. They like it. The only thing I'm allowed to do for them. They pick the book and I read a chapter or so. Well, that sounds interesting. You mind if I come along? <laughs> Not at all. Well, we'll go down this hatch over here. Follow me. This way. This way to the cruise quarters. Hi, everybody. Hello, man. This is Lieutenant Hale. Hello. Hey, How do you do, sir? I hope you don't mind if I just sit here and listen. Ah, oh, glad to have you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what book have you picked out for today? Well, you started The Lay of the Lance Minstrel yesterday. Right. Let's finish that. Yeah, good finish idea. That. Where is it? Here it is, sir. I've never heard of it. Oh, it's a good poem. I was on the third canto yesterday. Yeah, let's see. Oh, yes. I'll start here. The aged harper, how so ear, his only friend, his harp, was dear. Like not to hear it ranked so high above his flowing poesy. Less liked he still that scornful jeer. Misprized the land he loved so dear. High was the sound, as thus again the bard resumed his minstrel strain. Read more, Mr. Plain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Has, uh, has anybody got a glass of water for me? My voice is sort of going. Oh, sure, sure. Here you are, Mr. Nolan. I'll pour it for you. Thanks, sir. Ah, that's better. Now, the next verse. Quiet, everybody. Go ahead, Mr. Nolan. Breathe there a man with soul so dead who never to himself hath said, This is my own. My native land, whose heart ne'er within him burned, as home his footsteps he hath turned from wandering on a foreign strand. If such there breathe, go, mark him well, for him no minstrel raptures swell. High though his titles, proud his name, Boundless his wealth, as wish can claim. Despite these titles, power and pelf, the wretch concerted all in... Sir I'm sorry, boys. I don't think I feel up to reading today.
that's the way it was on board ship. Little things like that poem were always occurring, and poor Nolan tried to take it all like a man. He stayed below in his cabin for two days after that, and I didn't want to intrude myself on his misery. So I spent my time talking to the captain and the crew. It was late the second afternoon. Captain Shaw, myself, and Lieutenant Vaughan were standing at the rail. And, of course, the conversation turned to Nolan. Vaughan was saying... Funny thing about Nolan. He never allows anybody to come into his cabin. I wonder why. That's his business. I don't think we should intrude, Lieutenant. Well, sir, it was just curiosity. Hear what the men say about that cabin. And what do they say? Oh, some think it's full of voodoo tricks or some such nonsense. You know, Captain, if I were you, I'd order him to leave his cabin door open. Since I'm the captain, Mr. Vaughan, that decision is in my hands. Ship sighted off port, slaver! Uh, pardon me, gentlemen. Ship sighted off port, slaver! Lieutenant Vaughan. Yes, sir. To your post, sir. We'll be pulling alongside the ship to board her. Yes, of course, sir. Ship sighted off port, slaver! Ship sighted off port, slaver! The ship suddenly came to life. We had overhauled a dirty little schooner which had slaves on board. We fired two shots across her bow, and the little ship struck her colors. A boat and officer were sent to board her. There was considerable commotion on the slaver, and we waited patiently. Nolan came on deck and was standing at the rail talking to the captain when Lieutenant Vaughan returned to report to the captain. Captain, sir, yes. I can't understand them. Every man on board speaks some strange patois, though some of them can speak Portuguese. Portuguese, eh? Nobody on board here speaks Portuguese. I do, sir. I've learned to do many things in the ten years of spare time I've had. You know them, eh? Well, uh, would you oblige by acting as interpreter? Of course, sir. As well as I can. Thank you. Mr. Vaughan. Yes, sir. Have your men remove the handcuffs and the ankle irons from those men enslaved in that boat. Very well, sir. Uh, come along, then, Nolan. Lower second lifeboat, boatswain. This way, Mr. Nolan. The boat was lowered, and we rowed over to the slaver. We stalled in the waters for half an hour, giving Vaughan plenty of time to quell any manner of resistance. By the time we boarded the boat, the three-man crew was in chains, and the slaves, freed from their handcuffs and ankle irons, were swarming over the deck wildly jubilant, shouting. But the deck was dirty, and the stench from the ship was strong, and the three-man crew, chained to the mainmast, was shouting dire oaths at us as we boarded the side. Gracias a Dios! Sorte! Estaremos en casa dentro de poco tempo! Mr. Nolan, uh, ask those men which is their captain. Yes, sir. Come here, su capitão! Aquele ali! He's the tall man with the red hair, sir. Ask him if he knew that he was violating the law of the United... Ask him if he knew that he was violating the law, Mr. Nolan. Sabia que estava violando a leis dos Estados Unidos da América. Now say, now say nada. He says he knows nothing, sir. Nothing, eh? The rotten scoundrel. Look at the filth of this deck. Look at the way he had the slaves handcuffed. He knew. He knew what he was doing all right. He was dealing in human flesh. Tell the slaves, Nolan, they're free. Quietos todos. O capital Shaw do barco Nautilus. And uh, you can also tell them that their captain will be hanged as soon as I can find enough rope to hang him with. O capital, o capital, show this triple assault, set up for need. Tell them, tell them I'll take them to Cape Palmas. O capital, show this. Uh, what are they saying? I can't tell. They're all shouting at once. Wait till I single one of them out. Buse! Sing Buse! Venya ka silencio todos! Qui dizem estes homes? Non queremos ir a cabo das palmas. Queremos ir para casa. Ver a nossa gente. Voltar as nossas mulheres e filhos. Cabo das Palmas está muito longe, longe de casa. Meus companheiros estão doentes. Ia no meu barco à procura de um doutor. Estes diabos me capturaram. Nolan. Meu povo morreu e não vou. Me levaram contra mim de vontade. Quero ir para casa, para me olhar. Oh, oh, para me olhar. They want to go home to their country, to their children, to their wives. Oh. The first man wants his kinfolk. And the second man, he says his people are sick, very sick, and that he left his home to get a doctor, and that these devils kidnapped him. He wants to go home. Home, Captain. Every man wants to go home. Yes, of course, Nolan. 
Tell them yes. Tell them that they can go to the mountain of the moon if they want to. If I have to sail this schooner through the great white desert, they shall go home. Oh, Capitano Shaw! This school votero todos para casa! And so the slavers were returned to their homes. And they never forgot the look in the eyes of Nolan, the man who would help them. The rest of that journey was uneventful. When I left the Nautilus in the harbor of New York, I saw Nolan standing on the deck waving to me and shouting. And that was the last I ever saw of Philip Nolan. The very last. But I heard tale after tale of the courageous and self-sacrificing work that he did on board each and every ship he sailed on. And then this morning, I received a letter. A letter after 40 years have passed. A letter from Lieutenant Vaughan. Only he isn't a lieutenant now. He's a captain of his own ship. I opened the letter and started to read. Dear Mr. Hale, Philip Nolan died this morning. He never allowed anybody in his stateroom, as you know, until late last night. It was exactly four bills. I got a message from Nolan to come down to see him. I walked into the cabin, looked about for the first time. Do you know what that cabin contained? A shrine to America. A large American flag. A picture of Washington... A large bronze eagle. A map of the United States, which he had drawn from memory. And Nolan lay on his bed, beckoning me to come closer to him. Vaughn. Vaughn, I, I know I'm dying. But you see, I have a country. Vaughn, I've had a country with me all these years. In my heart, Vaughn, I'm dying. Surely you can tell me something now. Please. Just something. Of course, Philip. Anything you want. The map. Tell me what belongs on my map. Is the Mississippi Territory still the Mississippi Territory? No, it's a state now, Nolan. Mississippi, Missouri. Yes, yes, I've guessed that Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. Ohio was the last I knew. That makes 20 states in all. There are 34 now. Where are the other 14? You haven't cut up any of the old ones, I hope. They're not cut up. You're not pretty in the new 14 on your map for you. Uh, Florida. Imagine Florida State. Iowa. Illinois. Louisiana. What about Texas? What happened to Texas, Vaughn? Texas is part of the Union. Wonderful. Wonderful. And Arkansas. There's a good American name for you. Did you hear me say it, Vaughn? American. 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 <laughs> American. I said it, Vaughn. On this whole ship, in the whole of America, there's not a better American than myself. Not one better in the world. Is there, Vaughn? Not a better one anywhere, Philip. You're a real American. Thank you. Thank you, Vaughn. And his last wish was to have a gravestone somewhere in the United States. Do you think you can arrange for that gravestone, Hale? The letter was signed, Sincerely yours, Richard Vaughn, Captain, United States Navy. And in a churchyard in his own United States, there is a gravestone in memory of Philip Nolan, lieutenant in the Army of the United States. He loved his country as no other man loved her. But no man deserved less at her hands. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought to you the story, The Man Without a Country. Bellkeeper, hold the bells. 